Welcome to today's history lesson. We're going to look at ancient Egyptian medicine. As you know, this is a very interesting topic and I believe that some of our information is based on that for modern medicine as well. Now let's look at that. The medicine of ancient Egyptians is some of the oldest documented. For the beginning of the civilization in the late 4th millennium BC until the Persian invasion of 525 BC, Egyptian medis medical practices went largely unchanged but was highly advanced for its time, including simple non-invasive surgeries, setting of bones, dentistry, and an extensive set of uh, uh, pharma—I uh, would say pharmacy. Hmm. Egyptian medical thoughts uh, influenced later traditions including Greeks and um, uh, as you know the, our modern medicine is also based on Greek so it goes all the way back to Egyptian medicine right now let's look at the nutritions of the of this aspect the ancient Egyptians were at least partially aware of the importance of diet both in balance and moderation, owing to Egypt's great endowment of fertile land. Food production was never a major issue, although no matter how bountiful the land, um, paupers and starvation still exist. The main crops for most of the ancient Egyptian history were emmer, uh, wheat and barley, consumed in the forms of loaves which were produced in variety of types through baking and fermentation with yeast uh, greatly enriching the nutritional value of the product. One farmer's crop could support an in, uh, estimated 20 adults. Uh, barley was also used in beer. Uh, vegetables and fruits of many types were widely grown. Oil was produced from the linseed plant and there was a limited section of spices and herbs. Meat, uh, sheep, goats, pigs, wild game was regularly available to the, at least the upper classes and fish were widely consumed. Although there is evidence of prohibitions um, using uh, during search, certain period against certain type of animal products. Um, Herodotus wrote of pig as being unclean. Offerings to King Unas were recorded as uh, milk, three kinds of beer, five kinds of wine, ten loaves, flour, bread, uh, ten cakes, four meats, um, different cuts, joints, roast spleen, l limb, breast quail, goose, pigeon, figs, ten other fruits, three kinds of corn, uh, barley, spelt, five kinds of oil, and fresh plants. It's clear that a ancient Egyptian diet was not lacking of upper classes uh, for, for the upper classes and that even the lower classes may have had some selections. So um, as you can see, it has so much variety of products, of food, um, mainly mainly based on uh, natural. All all of it is based on natural products, and yeah, obviously, <laughs> and uh, fruits and vegetables were um, good supply. Um, I believe that grape was there, grape figs, um, providing very good nutritional value to the diet, uh, and uh, some of the wheat and barley is bringing in some uh, energy aspect of it, and yes, there's a lot of, lot of choices. And mainly their diet was based on fish too, like fish was available for 
the upper class, middle class, lower class, because you are easily available. You are able to fish from the Nile River. And fish is full of nutrition, good, beneficial. So now let's look at the pharmacology aspect of ancient Egyptian um, society. To many civilizations in the past, the ancient Egyptians amply discovered the medi medicinal properties of plants, life around them. And um, in the Edwin Smith papyrus, there are many recipes to help heal different ailments. In a small section of this papyrus, uh, there are five recipes. One dealing with problems wom women may have had, three on techniques for refining the uh, complexion, and the fifth recipe for ailment that deal with colon. The ancient Egyptians were known for to use honey as medicine and juices of pomegranate serve as both an astring astringent and also a delicacy. Um, as you know, uh, pomegranate is full of antioxidant and it's also full of vitamins and minerals. Such a good uh, product. It's a great fruit for um, in boosting your immune system. So, in the Ebers papyrus, there are over 800 remedies. Some were topical, like ointments um, and wrappings. Uh, others were oral, med oral medications, such as pills and mouth rinses. Still others were taken through inhalation. Um, the recipes to cure constipation consisted of berries from the castor oil tree, male palm and um, gentent beans, just to name a few. One recipe that was to help headaches was called for inner of onion, fruit of an em tree, natron, setseft seed, <laughs> um, bone of the swordfish, uh, cooked redfish, cooked um, skull of crayfish, cooked honey, and uh, abra a bra ointment. Uh, some of the recommended treatment made use of cannabis and incense. Um, Egyptian medic medicinal use of plants or antiquities known to be extensive with some 160 distinct plant products. Um, amidst the many plant extract and fruits, the Egyptians also used animal feces and some uh, metals as treatments. These prescriptions of antiquity were measured out by volume and not weight, which um, makes their precision making craft more like cooking than pharmacists do today. Uh, while their treatments and herbal remedies seem almost boundless, they still included incantation along with some therapeutical remedies. Um, Egyptian dr drug therapy is perceived uh, ineffective by today's standard according to Michael D. Parkins, who says that 28% of 260 medical prescription in the Harst papyrus had uh, ingredients which can be perceived to have had activity toward condition being treated and then another third supply to any disorder would produce a purgative effect on the gastrointestinal system. <coughs> so, um, practices. Let's look at practices. Medical knowledge in ancient Egypt had an excellent uh, reputation. While rulers of other em empires would ask the Egyptian pharaohs to send them their best physical physicians to treat their loved ones, Egyptians had some knowledge of human anatomy. For, for example, the in the classic mummification process, mummy fires knew how to insert a long hooked implement through the nostril, breaking the thin bone of brain case and uh, removing the brain. They also had general idea that inner organs are 
in the body cavity, they removed the organs through small incision in the left groin. Whether this knowledge was passed down the practitioners is unknown, yet it did not seem to have had any impact on their medical theories. And uh, the Egyptian physicians were aware of the existence of the pulse and its connection to the heart. Uh, the author of Smith Papyrus even had a vague idea of cardiac system, although he did not know about blood circulation and deemed it unimportant to distinguish between blood vessels and tendons and nerves, they developed their theory of channels that carried air, water, and blood through the body um, by analogies with the Nile River. Uh, if it became blocked, crops became unhealthy. That's what they implied. They applied this principle to the body. Uh, if a person was unwell, they would use laxatives to unblock the channels. Uh, many of their medical practices were, in, uh, were effective, such as surgical procedures given in the Edwin Smooth Papyrus. Mostly, the physician's advice for staying healthy was to wash and shave the body, including underarms to prevent infections. They also advised patients to look after their, their diet and avoid foods such as raw fish and other animals considered to be unclean. And that is um, very good advice. I would say it would be one of the best advice that any kind of physicians or doctors could give to um, their patients from young to old. Um, diet is most important. Exercise also. <laughs> but in that time, you don't really need to exercise. You have to exercise. So just looking after their diet. Don't eat raw fish, raw food or anything. Mm. Yeah, I don't think they would eat sushi these days. Mm, nah. Okay, now let's look at the surgery aspect of the ancient Egyptians. The oldest bronze or copper surgical tools in the world were discovered in the tomb of Kar. Uh, surgery was a common practice among the physicians as treatment for physical injuries. The Egyptian physicians recognized three categories of injuries uh, treatable, contestable, and untreatable ailments. Treatable ailments uh, the surgeons would quickly set to right. Uh, contestable ailments were those where the victim could uh, presumably survive without treatment. So the patients assumed to be in this category were observed and if they survived, then surgical attempt could be made to fix the problem with them. They used knives, hooks, drills, forceps, pincers, scales, spoons, saws, and the vase with burning incense. And circumcision of males was a normal practice as uh, stated by Herodotus in his histories. Uh, through its per performance as a procedure was rarely uh, mentioned the uncircumcised uh, nature of other cultures were frequently noted and uncircumcised nature of the Liberians was frequently referenced in military campaigns brought back uncircumcised folly as trophies which um, suggest novelty <laughs> well some some information. Um, well, however, other records describe initiates um, this into this the religious order as involving circumcision, which would imply that the practice was special and not widespread. The only known um, prediction of the procedure in the tomb of the physician burial of um, Akhmahor as Sakara uh, shows adolescents or adults, not babies. Female circumcision may have been practiced, although the single reference to it in ancient texts may be mistranslation. Uh, 
Yeah, that would be a very strange instance. Yeah, um, prosthetics such as artificial toes and eyeballs were also used. Typically, they served little more than decorative purposes in preparation for burial. Missing body parts could be replaced. However, these do not appear as if they could have been useful or even attachable before death. Uh, the extensive use of surgery and mummification practices and autopsy as religious exercise gave Egyptians a vast knowledge of the body, body's morphology, and even a considerable understanding of organ function. The function of most major organs was cons uh, correctly presumed. For example, like blood was correctly guessed to be transpiration medium for vitality and waste which is not too far from its actual role in carrying oxygen and removing carbon dioxide with the exception of the heart and brain whose functions were switched. Now, uh, it's such an interesting topic for s surgeries. Um, it is, though it is really, it is really kind of scary to think about uh, surgery in this uh, era. Uh, it is interesting that the early ancient Egyptians practiced this much surgery. Um, I was not aware of that. But I, I was aware of mummification process, but it's a bit different when you when the mummification process and the living surgery. Yeah. Now let's look at the dentistry aspect of it um, because it it is very interesting and very important. Dentistry was an important field. As an independent profession, it dated from the early 3rd millennium BC. Although it may never have been prominent, the Egyptian diet was high in abrasive from sand left over from the grinding grains and bits of rocks in which the way the bread was prepared and so conditions of their teeth was poor. Archaeologists may have noted steady decrease in severity and incidence of worn teeth throughout 4000 BC to 1000 AD, probably due to uh, improved grain grinding techniques. All Egyptian remains have set of teeth in quite poor states. Uh, dental disease could even be fatal, such as um, a musician from TVs who died around the age of 35 from extensive dental disease and a large inset infected cyst. Hmm. Um, sounds a little... Well, uh, a little scary. If an individual's teeth uh, escape being worn down, cavities were rare due to the rarity of sweeteners, a dental treatment was ineffective and the best sufferers could hope for was the quick loss of an infected tooth. Mm, uh, introduction of Ashis Ankhshishop uh, <laughs> contains the maxim, there's no tooth that rots yet stays in place. Um, no record ducklings and the fastening of this process and no tools suited for the extraction of the teeth were found though some remain show the sign of forced tooth removal the replacement teeth have been found although it's not clear whether they're just post-mortem cosmetics or um, uh, before mortem extreme pain might have been <laughs> Uh, medicated with opium. Yes, okay. So, pretty interesting news. Um, so, th there was not much cavity in the 4000 BC and 1000 AD due to no sweeteners, uh, sugars, or anything like that. Um, so, natural. Proper, although they did have sweeteners such as honey, 
they used to use a lot of honey um, honeys were for the upper class individuals and lower class uh, people would have eaten something like dates and uh, fruits and juices so I guess those those sugar natural sugars are very very uh, non-cavity causing and very healthy in s- some ways so that is very interesting when the teeth doesn't have cavities it won't fall off it would just be rotting and in place <laughs> uh, it will be the most mostly what happened is it was mostly due to um, just some grinding of the bread the flour the flour making a grain making process so they they would actually eat into a a bit of rock so maybe that's how it kind of cracked the teeth yeah so that's a little bit of concerning right next let's look into the magic and religion aspect of uh, ancient Egyptian medicine magic and religion were integral part of everyday life of an ancient Egypt evil gods and demons were thought to be responsible for any many ailments so often the treatment was involved with this supernatural element such as um, beginning treatment with an appeal to a deity uh, there does not appear to have existed a clear distinction between what now, nowadays one would consider the very distinct callings of priests and physicians. The healers may have them priests of sick myth, often used incantation and magic as part of the treatment. Uh, the widespread belief in magic and religion may have resulted in a powerful pl- placebo effect that is that perceived the the perceived validity of the cure may have been contributed to its effectiveness such as a psychological effect of these things does affect the patient and when the person believes that it will affect the patient the patient will definitely uh, I guess it will help heal its own body the impact of the emphasis on magic is seen in the selection of remedies and ingredients for them um ingredients were sometimes selected seemingly because they were derived from a substance plant or animal that had characteristics in which some ways corresponded to symptoms of the patient which is known as principle of simila similibus similar with similar and is throughout the history of medicine up to the modern practice of homeopathy uh, thus an ostrich egg is included in the treatment of broken skull and an amulet portraying a hedgehog might be used against baldness Amulet in general were very popular. They were worn for many magical purposes. Health related amulets are classified as homeopoietic, phylactic, and uh, theophoric. Homeopoietic amulets portray an animal or part of an animal f- from which the wearer hopes to gain positive attributes like strength or speed. Philactic and amulet protected against harmful gods or demons. The famous Eye of Horus was often used on a philactic amulet. Theoporic amulet represented Egyptian gods. One represented the girdle of Isis and is intended to stem the, fo- uh, stem the flow of blood at miscarriage they were often made of bone and hanging from a leather strap Mm. okay now let's look at to the doctors and other healers the ancient egyptian word for doctor is swnw i wouldn't presume to know how to pronounce that 
This title has a long history. Uh, the earliest recorded physician in the world, Hesi Ra, practiced in ancient Egypt. He was chief of dentists and physicians to King Doser, um, who ruled in tr 27th century BC. The Lady Peseshet, 2400 BC, may be the first recorded female doctor. She was possibly the mother of Akhetotep. And on a stella dedication dedicated to her in his tomb, she's referred to as Emir Suspen, <laughs> SWNWT, which was translated to Lady Overseer of the Lady Physicians. Um, SWNWT is the feminine of SWNW. There were many ranks of ranks and spe specialization in the field of medicine. Royalty employed their own SWNWs, even um, their own specialists. There were inspector doctors, uh, overseers, and chief doctors. Known ancient Egyptian specialists are ophthalmologist, gastro and gastroenterologist, proctologist and dentist, doctor who supervises but butchers and an unspecified inspector of liquids. Um, the ancient Egyptian term for proctologist Neru Puit literally translates shepherd of the anus. The latter title is already attested 2200 BC in Irinakit. The institution called Per Ankh of or House of Life are known to have been established in the ancient Egypt since first dynasty in May. I've had medical functions being at times associated with ins in inscriptions with physicians such as Peftaulnit and um, living in the middle of a first dynasty millennium BC first millennium BC, <laughs> excuse me by the time of the 19th dynasty their employees enjoyed benefits such as medical insurance, pension and sick leave uh, what an amazing amazing interesting view of this they enjoyed medical insurance, pensions, and sick leave in the 19th dynasty in ancient Egypt. Not, not bad. Not bad at all. Um, now let's look at the table of ancient Egyptian physicians. Imhotep. Imhotep. Uh, one who comes in peace uh, was a, an Egyptian chancellor to Pharaoh de Djoser, a probable architect of the step pyramid and high priest of the sun god Ra and Heliopolis. Very little is known of Imhotep uh, as a historical figure, but in the 3000 years following his death, he was gradually glorified in deity, deified. Uh, right, that, let's look at his, let's look at his accomplishments. Durser circa, um, during the time of 2650 to 2600 BC, he was, the titles are, he was the Chancellor of King of Egypt, Doctor, first in line after the King Upper of Upper Egypt, Administrator of the Great Palace, Hereditary Nobleman, High Priest of Heliopolis, Builder, chief carpenter, chief sculptor, and maker of vases in chief. 
an amazing title and uh, his gender is male he's from medical practice site was Memphis and medical legacy was 2000 years after his death Imhotep uh, status was raised to that of a deity of medicine and healing whether he was actually a physician is actually debated non-medical legacies Imhotep was one of the chief officials of the pharaoh uh, de Djoser and uh, Egyptologists ascribed to him the design uh, the uh, pyramid of this de Djoser the step pyramid at Saqqara in Egypt in 16 uh, 2630 to 2611 BC um, he may have been responsible for the first known use of column to support a building the Egyptian historian Maneto credited him for with the invention of the method of a stone dressed um, building during the Joseph's reign his burial site is probably at Saqqara um, next there is Hesira Re Hesi Hisar Hisera that is the other names and uh, this is um, the Joser circa 2670 BC uh, it is known as the great the great one of the dentist and male possibly the first known dentist in history so He's also un, non-medical legacies, wooden panel a set of Hesira and that is the first dentist of his, uh, in the history of the world Hesira Okay, now let's look at the Merit Ptah uh, Beloved of the God Ptah So that is uh, this position's name and uh, she, yes, female was uh, during 2700 BC uh, she was the chief physician and her medical legacy is known to be possibly known for the the first known female physician and scientist in history and her image in a tomb in Saqqara is known to be her non-medical uh, legacy and let's look at next Uh, Pentu and uh, it's Pentu was around um, Akhenaten in 1350 BC or later and uh, Pentu's title was the seal bearer of the king of lower Egypt the sole companion the attendant of the lord of the two lands the favorite of the good god king's scribe the king's subordinate first servant of the Aten in the mansion of the Aten in Akhenaten uh, chief of physicians and the chamberlain uh, he was a male and uh, his medical practice in it was in Aten and his medical legacy was chief physician to Akhenaten but may have been survived the upheaval of the end of the Amarna period um, and served under Ai after being vizier under Tutankhamun and his non-medical legacy is obviously being vizier to the king 
and his burial site is Amarna tomb 5 and now let's look at another one which is very interesting Peseshet Peseshet uh, she was yes she was the fourth dynasty of the Egypt circa 2500 BC lady overseer of female physicians uh, and a medical legacy was midwife secondarily is known female physician in the ancient Egypt and uh, non-medical legacy is a personal stella at Akhetep her son's tomb and Kar is next in Kar was active during 6th dynasty of Egypt circa uh, 2350 to 2180 BC he's a royal physician and the oldest bronze or copper surgical tool in the world he he's known for that medically and non-medically his mummy in the limestone sarcophagus sarcophagus and 22 bronze statue of the different deities and set statuette of Imhotep the physician is also his another legacy um, he died at the age of 50 years and was buried in his tomb at Saqqara which was reused several times and there's a next one is Psamtik Sunip um, may King Psamtik be healthy is another name uh, and uh, he was he was active during 26th dynasty of Egypt circa 664 to 525 BC the head of physician and the scorpion charmer chief physician and the chief dentist of Samtik Sineb and admirer of the royal fleet he's known for non-medical legacy as Ushapti of the head of physician Samtik Sineb photo in relief of Ankhet and Sef Seknep entertained by a harpist and his tomb is discovered at Heliopolis in 1931 or 32 AD. We're going to uh, Oja Horesnet, or his other name is Oja Horesne or Oja Horesnet from Amasis to Darius I. Now uh, his title was super long uh, the head of physician supervisor of medical schools the house of life the prince the royal counselor uh, chancellor the unique companion the prophet of the one who lives with them <laughs> the chief physician the the one truly known and loved by the king and the scribe the inspector of the scribes of the Didet court the first among the great scribes of the prison the director of pal the palace the admirer of the royal navy of the king of the upper and lower Egypt Knemnimbre and the admirer of the royal navy of the king of the upper and lower Egypt and Kainre and the head of the province of Saiz Pef Tuonet. What a mouthful of words and titles, non stop. But his um, medical legacy is Wejahor Resne composed um, Kambisi's new royal name in Mesuti Ra, born of Ra, and his not med non medical legacies. His titles are preserved on a beautiful statue in the Vatican, um, and his tomb has been discovered in 1995 in Abu Sir. 
Um, now let's look at the Harsius' son of Ramnos and he was active during Amasis to Darius I uh, his titles were the head of physicians and chief physician of Upper and Lower Egypt, leader of Aegean um, uh, foreign troops, and admiral of the royal fleet. This uh, so this concludes today's ancient Egypt history lesson. There were lots of information provided uh, on the medical. Uh, uses and medical history of ancient Egypt. This was fairly a very good um, information that was provided. Uh, there was so many uses and new like concept that was not available thousands of years later on. So it is very important for um, for us to understand, I guess, and it's very interesting, definitely, for me to understand and see all this uh, history on what we build our technologies on. So there are new, new theories, new medical uses, new things discovered every, every single day, and thinking backwards. Uh, surgical things that were used in surgical, um, like it was surgical implanta implementation and procedures that was done back then. It was very interesting to learn that they were really ahead of their time, but this is not completely a complete understanding of all of the medical. Mm, I would say medical history of ancient Egypt if we were able to see all of what they do it's just beyond our imagination it is just like fiction uh, because we don't see everything we would assume some parts and think of our favorite movies such as The Mummy <laughs> my favorite movie is The Mummy for example um, and Imhotep was the I would say chief physician to the king back then and it is such an amazing uh, thing to read when this whole thing was based on so uh, thank you so much for joining me today for the history lessons today hope that you have enjoyed today's lesson and see you again for another history lesson another time. Goodbye.